I have in my hands a souvenir from the recent ice storm that's caused so much damage and difficulty here in the church house. Uh, if you can't see it from where you're seated, I will hold it after the service so that you can see it in person. It is a five, six inch piece of copper pipe that was burst by frozen water. It's really amazing how much damage a little bit of ice can do. Most of us probably had ice in a soft drink at some point this past week. A little piece of ice, like what we had in our cup, caused such damage. In fact, I was speaking earlier in the week with the folks from Bradley Mechanical who have been here and continue to make repairs. At last count, they had found 57 places, just like this, where the pipes had become frozen and burst. Now, I'm not sure exactly what happened, not sure if the heat failed or the cold simply overwhelmed the heat, but something happened, and we're all familiar with the results. The pipes burst in bathrooms, in radiator units, and in the sprinkler system that the church has to help save it from destruction by fire. And the water began to flow several gallons at a minute. It started in the Welcome Center, where it was at its worst. It flowed all through the offices, caused damages to paper and books and carpets and more. It continued down the hallway to the Education Building, causing damage in the nursery class, in the room where the Virginia Homes meet, all the way down the Fellowship Hall. Because some of the pipes were from the fire sprinkler system, the nearby fire department received a call. They came out and turned off the water. If it had not been for their response, the damage could have been catastrophic. But in addition to shutting off the water, they also shut off the electricity. That meant that the sub pump in the basement stopped working. Knee-high frozen water filled the basement where the furnace is kept. That was the first thing that had to be addressed. When Gina and I came down here on a Sunday afternoon, the repairmen were trying to get the water out of the basement. For every gallon they removed, two more seemed to be flowing back in. But finally they got the issue resolved. Tiles have come up along the floors. Carpets will need to be replaced. Walls will have to be repaired. Because of the fans constantly blowing, the noise and the dirt that's put up into the air because of the fans blowing, we've not yet been able to reclaim the office space. Frankly, it had been much worse if Tommy Richardson had not stopped by at the building when he did. Many of the furnishings and office equipment were saved because of his action. And in addition to Tommy, Gerald and Mike Utley have spent many hours down here waiting for plumbers and repairmen and insurance agents to come and investigate and repair. And if all that wasn't bad enough, it happened at a terrible time for Brian Sneed because he was recovering from surgery. He needed to be at home resting, but you know in a situation like this, he's not going to stay at home and rest. He was out here on several occasions. So Tommy and Gerald and Mike and Brian are not guys that like attention to be called to them. They don't like to take credit for the things that they do. But I think we owe them a debt of gratitude for all they've done. And it would be appropriate to applaud them. We did miss gathering on one Sunday as the result of the ice and cold. Whether the perps had ice, pipes had burst or not, we would not have met on that day. The following Sunday, a small group of us met in the basement at Monument Heights Baptist Church. We are grateful to our sister congregation and my good friend Randy Clip for providing us a place to worship. The following week, we met for worship, but we did not have Sunday school, but we did gather about 30 minutes before worship to have coffee and donuts. This has prompted several of you to suggest, because of the crowd that came to see the mess and eat the donuts, that we should keep the mess and eat donuts every Sunday. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thankfully, the church 
is adequately insured. There will be some expenses, obviously, that will come that are beyond what the insurance will take care of. But this sort of thing is what happens when you have a big building. As many around here are prone to say from time to time, it is what it is. The tragedy happened at the beginning of our Lenten worship gatherings. I found that interesting. Lent is a time for personal reflection and sacrifice in order that we might better remember God's gifts of life and grace. If you are involved in a Lenten sacrifice and you are a part of this church, I think Lent is sort of redundant at this point. So, with this being the season of Lent, and with this copper pipe in front of us, I would like for us to explore some lessons that we might be able to learn from this situation. What are some lessons from a busted water pipe? Earlier, I called your attention to 2 Samuel 7, 6. The context is simply this. King David had been surveying his palatial estate. It symbolized his power and wealth and influence in the world. And as he did so, as he looked at all of his buildings, he saw over in the corner the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tiny little tent in comparison to the buildings on his estate. It was the tent that God had ordered built when the people of Israel were wandering in the wilderness as nomads from one place to another. King David looks out over his estate and he sees the tabernacle and he comes up with a bright idea. I'm going to build me a house for God, he says. Now that's not an exact quote, but it gets to the heart of the matter. You see, in his eyes, the tabernacle was an eyesore next to his stately manor. And God did not ask for it, but David decided to build his patron deity a new house. Notice, it did not originate with God. God had commanded the building of the tabernacle. But God never initiated, asked for, or requested the building of the temple. God had provided blueprints and specific instructions for the building of the tabernacle, but God did not provide those for the temple. And while we don't know what happened to the tabernacle, we do know that God seemed willing on more than one situation in the history of Israel to allow the temple that had been built as his dwelling place to be toppled over and destroyed. All in all, it seemed that God tolerated the temple, but God loved the tabernacle. One lesson that we can learn from the text and from our experience with the busted water pipe is that building should never become the focus of our attention. The building is not the church. This place is not what Paul was referring to when he said you are the body of Christ. The building is not where God lives. This is a meeting house, and it's significant to us. It's a place where we gather for worship and fellowship and Bible study and occasionally some activities to connect with the community. But this building is not the church. You are the church. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. Each and every one of us are a part of it. We are the incarnation of Jesus in the world, just as he was the incarnation of his Father. We are the body of Christ. Our world does not best see Jesus or hear the gospel in a building. It best sees and hears and experiences the person and presence of Jesus by the things that you and I say and do when we live our lives outside the building all of the other days of the week. So the first lesson that we can learn from busted water pipes is that this building is not the church. A second lesson involves how we see the way we engage the world as we live our Christian life. It is far better for us to see ourselves as tabernacle Christians than as temple Christians. I know that we are still in the middle of Lent, but if you don't mind, let's jump 
just a few weeks ahead to the season of Easter and see some of the things that Jesus said. You see, after his resurrection, Jesus was anything but stationary and static. He was always on the move. In the story of the angelic visitors who declare the resurrection to the women who were at the tomb, they say to the women, go and find his disciples and tell them that he has gone on ahead of you to Galilee. From that point on, Jesus is always on the move and the disciples are always trying to catch up. Every time they think they have him cornered, he simply vanishes from their sight only to reappear later at some other place, the upper room near the lake on the road to Emmaus at Mount Olivet. Jesus is always on the move. And when we see the stories of the coming of the Holy Spirit upon the life of the church, we see the same thing. They are gathered together in prayer, and as they are, the Holy Spirit falls upon them, and the first thing that the Spirit does is drive them out of the room into the community, out into the highways and byways, the side streets and sidewalks, the neighborhoods and shopping centers. From the day of Pentecost forward, the Spirit is always moving the church farther and farther away both theologically and geographically, always moving them away from the building, away from the temple, and into the community. The Spirit of God is with the Jewish converts to Christianity during the diaspora when they are scattered out across the world. The Spirit of God is with the Apostle Paul as he takes the gospel on missionary journeys into Gentile lands. Just as God seems to love the freedom of the tabernacle, so too does the post-resurrected Jesus and the Holy Spirit always seem to be on the move. Jesus is always a few steps ahead of his disciples. The Spirit is always pushing and prodding the disciples to expand where they are, to step out of their comfort zones. The church today needs to follow Jesus by the power of the Spirit and go outside the confines of the building that have been entrusted into its possession. We need to step outside the comfort zone of this building and connect to new people in new ways so that we can be the body and presence of Jesus and proclaim his gospel where the people are. This is the lifestyle that Jesus calls us to. To be a fully devoted follower of Jesus we have to join Jesus out there because out there is where it's at. Out there is where he is at. He's always at work in the world. Listen to the words that are spoken on the day of Jesus' ascension. Matthew says that he told his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. Mark says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke and Acts says that Jesus told his disciples that they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The temple mentality is a static, settled, stationary mentality. The tabernacle is always moving. The tabernacle is always active and alive. And that's the kind of lifestyle Jesus calls us. Now, our denominational traditions have taught us to count pennies in the plate and people in the pews because of inflation. It's now pennies and people instead of butts in the offering plate and butts in the pews. Uh, there's, there's a price to pay. I can remember when I was younger and the offering envelopes would be handed to me and they would inquire, many of you remember this as well, did you go to Sunday school? Check. Did you bring your Bible? Check. Were you going to go to church training? Check. Were you in worship? Check. And these are all the metrics, all of these checks of the temple mentality. They are how we measure the constructures by which we've been taught to evaluate our success and well-being of the church. Maybe that's why some of us have been depressed when we've gathered together lately. If we're using the metrics of the temple, we feel like we're faltering and failing. 
four or five years ago, we were welcoming new members on a regular basis. Young people and young adults were being baptized regularly. We were seeing, on occasion, over 100 in Sunday school, 125 plus in worship. On high attendance days like Easter, we would be right up there on the 200 mark in worship. And it made us feel good about ourselves. But my, how a few years can change things. All of the college students that used to sit over here from MCV have graduated and gone their way to new communities and careers. Many of the teenagers that sat in various places have graduated and gone to college. They're with us on occasion on holidays and in the summer, but even in the summer, they've been involved in mission and ministry work. Several in our community have had to relocate because of difficulties with their careers, because of struggles with their family, or because they have been moved into nursing home facilities and more stressful than anything else, we have stood near the casket of nearly 50% of our active worship participants. Then the water pipes bust. 57 different places. Insult to injury. What more can we take? Now, if our God still abides in the temple, then the metric is going to be all about pennies in the plate and people in the pews. But what if God really does prefer the tabernacle over the temple? What if God really does exist out there in the world waiting for us to come and join him? What if Jesus has already moved on ahead of us and is beckoning us to come and follow him in the world? What if the Holy Spirit, who drove the disciples out of the upper room and into the marketplace and schoolyards and community centers, is trying to do the same thing with us? What if Jesus really meant what he said when he said we had to go? I just read a book by Annie Hammond, one of my mentors, titled, Recovering Hope for Your Church, Moving Beyond Maintenance to Missional and then into incarnational engagement. The title alone speaks to our hunger. Just the first few words, recovering hope for your church. Wouldn't you like to recover hope in this community of faith? Hope is not found in the building because God does not reside in the temple. Hope is found in the world where we are called to go and be the people of God. We have lots of constructors, and that's what we count. Eddie's book challenged us to think beyond counting constructors and to start celebrating ghost structures. What might that look like? What if every organizational structure in the life of this congregation committed to spending at least 50% of its time and energy praying and strategizing for ways to go and build relationships with those who are not a part of this fellowship? What if the deacons and the Sunday school classes and the choir and the praise team and the WMU and the pastor spent 50% of the time and resources entrusted into our care trying to discern ways that get outside the walls of the building and into the community where God's planted us? What if instead of counting how many people are in the pew on Sunday, we started tallying the relationships that we established throughout the week in the community. What if we started counting how many children's lives were touched by those who are part of our fellowship who are tutoring in the Micah Initiative? What if we started counting and celebrating the partnerships that we've made with businesses and civic groups and charitable organizations? Misty just received a phone call from Walgreens, one of our partners in the Fall Festival. They have come and asked if we might not partner with them to help initiate some health care initiatives with seniors in the community. We need somebody who would be willing to take charge of organizing that on our behalf, not leaving it to Misty, who does a lot of these things. That's kind of the ghost structures that God brings to our attention. And when God brings them, will we reach out? and grab them. Here's the point. The call of God is not that we come to a building. The call of God is that we go from the building into our communities. Let's think about Jesus for a moment. 
We know that Jesus spent a fair amount of his time teaching in the synagogue and making a pilgrimage to the temple. We know that because often when he went, as Kim brought to our attention in the children's sermons, when he arrived he caused nothing but turmoil among those with the settled and exclusive attitudes and actions. He cleaned out the joint. The vast majority of the time, however, Jesus was not involved in the religious institutions of the day. He was connecting to people. He was often found in the home of tax collectors, having dinners with the sinners of the day. He was at wedding celebrations, making the best wine they ever tasted. He was at the border near Sumeria, healing a colony of lepers. He was at the well with the woman of ill repute. We see him with the sick and the hurting and the infirm, bringing healing and hope and life. We see Jesus with the grief-stricken and mourning, bringing joy by raising the dead. We see Jesus fully participating in people's lives, bringing joy and hope and inclusion and acceptance. How exciting it would be if we got outside the walls of this building and into people's lives to be an instrument of God's grace. What kind of, what kind of metrics would that be? How would we count that? Y'all know a few years ago, I was very sick. It was the occasion of Lee's 25th anniversary celebration as a member of the staff of this church involved in music ministry. But on the morning of the celebration, I was dizzy and weak and nauseous, could not even walk across the room. I was finally taken to the doctor. My cholesterol was high. My triglycerides were high. My blood pressure was off the charts. My blood glucose was extremely high. I knew that something had to be done or that I would be done for. So we had a silent auction here at the church, a fun and fitness festival, and in that I bid on and won a membership to Gold's Gym. Since then, I have won two additional years. I haven't paid those people a dime for my membership yet. I've been very committed to my physical health, very committed to my well-being, trying hard to lose weight and get in proper shape. And along the way, something unusual has happened. For some at the gym, I've become sort of a chaplain. Not because I've inserted myself into their lives, but because I've been invited into their lives. One lady comes to me and says, my daughter's getting married in a year. We don't even have a church. Would you consider doing her wedding? Pastor Bill, how are you, my brother, says the man who was my trainer this past Monday at 5.30 in the morning. He always asked, as he did that morning, what's the sermon topic for this coming Sunday? You're a pastor, aren't you, said one young man. In fact, he said, you're that pastor. <laughs> I don't know what that pastor is, I said, but I am a pastor. He said, I'm a Muslim, and I'm sick to death of what's being done in the name of my religion, and I'd like to talk to a Christian about this, because I'm not sure I can talk to my Muslim friends. Can we talk? Sure, we can talk. You and Gina have been married for 25 years? 26, but it's 25 that this happened. I, I know, I know, I got it. Here. You and Gina have been married for 25 years, said one woman after hearing me brag on the occasion of our anniversary. I don't know if my marriage is going to last the rest of this year. That was an open door. We talked about love and relationship. Hey, can I talk to you for a few minutes, asked the beautiful young lady. I've been married 25 years, but if a beautiful young lady comes to me and says, can we talk, I say yes. She's a nurse. Her husband is a surgeon. They are both recent graduates, just getting started in their business. Sure, we can talk. What's up? Well, I'm just a little depressed. One of the patients on the floor where I work just died. I was in the room when it happened. I've never been in the room with somebody when they died. I'm not sure I can do this anymore. There was a tear streaming down her face. 
These are six spiritual conversations with people that took place outside the wall. Each one started as an invitation from the other simply because I had lived my faith as best I could for them to see. That's just in the last few months. There are many dozens more conversations that have happened just like that. And I know you've had some of those kinds of conversations as well. What if when we gathered together in the building, one of the things that we began to do was count those kinds of conversations that have happened through the week? What if we gathered together to pray for those developing relationships and for the witness to the gospel that they provide us? What if, what if we began to live our faith outside the building? With all of the fans that are blowing the air around, I haven't been able to study in the office. There's so much noise, there's so much dust, and so much stuff in the air. So I would stay at home and sit in my recliner to try to prepare. But if I sit in the recliner for too long, I fall asleep. So I decided to go and check out the library. Surprisingly, the library was much too noisy. And if I sit in a restaurant and don't buy a bunch of food during the time I'm there, I feel guilty. So I've been sitting at the nearby Barnes and Noble. I was sitting there this past Thursday preparing the final manuscript for this sermon. As I wrote, there were two young ladies seated at tables next to mine. They started a conversation. They were both wearing t-shirts that indicated that they had some kind of connection to the Christian faith. Both were recent college graduates just a few months into the city of Richmond. One of them turned towards me and apologized if their conversation was disturbing me. Oh my goodness, no, I said. I'm a pastor and I'm happy to see that God is forming a friendship right here in front of me. There were two older men standing nearby. They were looking at the cover of Easy Rider magazine. I had noticed that it was difficult to concentrate on sermon work looking at the cover of Easy Rider magazine. Out of nowhere, hearing the conversations, one of the men volunteered saying, I don't like churches and I don't trust preachers, he said. They are all self-centered and greedy. Well, that's quite the challenge, isn't it? I know a lot of preachers, I said. There are some churches and pe preachers like that, but I can assure you most are not that way. I don't think I'm that way. The man immediately apologized to his credit. The words just came out before I could stop them, he said. I've had some bad experiences with church. The two young ladies invited these two elderly men to join them for a conversation. One of the gals got up and brought both of these guys a cup of coffee. For the next 30 minutes, we all listened as this man shared his story. We listened as he shared his story. I received a phone call, had to leave. I excused myself, and as I did, one of the young ladies said, I get what you're saying about some churches. I bet you that man's church is not like that. Neither is the one that I've been going to. We really try to love people because we've met Jesus. Whatever she said after that, I didn't hear. I had walked away. I was too far to hear. But I can guess where she was going. A temple mindset thinks that church is the place that we gather to fix the busted water pipes. A tabernacle mentality sees the church as the people of God who are called to enter the world to love people and to minister to their needs in the name of Jesus. And that is who we are, whether we act like it all the time or not. We are the church, not bricks and mortar or busted water pipes. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. We are the ongoing presence of Jesus in the world. So here's the challenge. This week, let's just be who we are on every possible occasion. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. 
The hymn number is 350. We will stand and sing. If there's a public response that you need to make in our gathered community worship, you are certainly invited to make that. But there certainly is a lifestyle commitment and response we can make as we hit the doors to leave the building and enter the mission field. Let's stand as we sing and consider God's call, number 350.